Uh, my name is David Murphy, and you are here to try to uncover some of the challenges around homework battles and how to strengthen executive functioning skills within the home. Uh, the framework of that is that parents typically see their children struggle with one of, the, one of their most important responsibilities at this age, middle school, high school. It's homework, it's school. When you take a hierarchy of their priorities, school sits on number three. First priority is health, second priority is family. School usually fits up there around category three. And therefore, you, we, we treat homework as a significant milestone in their development. And we watch them struggle. What I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to try to frame that, the, that, that homework deficits or homework challenges is not a disability, but what we see is a symptom of what might be prevalent in homework, but also in other categories of their life, in other areas of their life, in other roles in their life. So we're going to try to blow up this construct of, of homework as being the central platform, and I'm going to help you to see problems in a more of a life skills perspective. So, so in doing that, we're going to start to uncover opportunities to help our children problem solve, opportunities to help our children self-regulate, opportunities to help our children initiate, prioritize, organize, and assess, evaluate that have nothing to do with homework, but have everything to do with life skills and age-appropriate milestones as they grow and mature and see their life past college so they're not coming home and living in your basement and that they are entering the real world, achieving their goals. And so I care very little about homework. I absolutely don't care about it at all. I'm a special ed teacher. I teach all day long, 20 years of special ed. I leave the classroom and then I go out and do this kind of work. So I'm in the classroom and I'm working with kids in high school. And here I am saying I care very little about homework. I get why homework is extremely important. But I care more about life skills. And I care more about problem solving skills. I care more about self-efficacy, the building the capacity to solve and face challenges and overcome anxiety, overcome fear, and overcome challenges as they become relevant to their goals and their future. So a little bit, back, a little bit of my background. So as I just said, I'm a special ed teacher by day. I've been doing that for 20 years. I used to be a, uh, a private school special ed director in Connecticut. I kind of retired from that and went back to the classroom. And after getting uh, two master's degree, I thought, why not just go for my doctorate? And uh, I did that in the wee hours of the night. And anybody that's gone for their masters, if not higher with children, understand that you face quitting multiple times and then it's your spouse that says you're not quitting. So that happened three times in my process of finishing my doctorate. But after doing that, I started tutoring and I thought, why am I tutoring? I know I know more than tutoring. And I started to develop this process around building, looking at what we call executive functions skills or executive function deficits. Uh, as, a, um, as a business. And I started to work with parents, families, kids, and districts on, uh, on trying to help create systemic change. And as a teacher, I love being able to go into the home because as a teacher, it's, used to, it's one of the frontiers we can't help in. So when coming into the private practice, I'm like, wow, this is awesome. I get to roll my sleeves and go into the home and solve problems where, at, at, at the ground level. And to me, that was the most rewarding experience that I, I, I ever started. Now, teaching's great, but to be able to go into the home and do it d and look at the other side of the coin uh, is, was even more affirming. And then starting to look at taking a whole child and saying, this child's not just a student, this child's not just a teenager, this child's not just an athlete. There's so much more to them, and they already know they're struggling. They know they suck at math. They know they suck at English. They know they suck at homework. So how do we sh change the story? How do we find their strengths? How do we find what they're great at so they can start to affirm this, their place on this planet to start to achieve their goals, to start to move p with their strengths, with their, with their gifts, with their skills, and create a path of success as opposed to being a victim of their deficits and being, um, and, and being framed as a, as, a, as a dumb kid and so on and so forth. So 
many children with executive function deficits, they cannot picture the future. The term used is episodic memory. It's this ability to be able to see my, my future as a image. And because I, because I struggle with that future picture of my identity or task or goals, I struggle with the task analysis to get there. It can be simply cleaning up your room. It can be simply organizing your backpack for a weekend field trip. But I don't see the outcome as clearly as a typical functioning executive function, uh, a typical brain would at age appropriate milestones. That being the case, we have to appreciate that if I don't picture the future, I'm going to be really disorganized and dysregulated in the path to get there. So in this journey of being a parent with a child with executive function deficits or, or, uh, or self-regulation deficits, uh, and they're in, in my world they're interchangeable, I have to train my child to see the future with greater clarity. It's significant. And I have to press pause on their, on their, on their world, my world, to create the engagement to allow, oh, there I am. <laughs> to create the engagement, to allow the discussion, the analysis, the, pit, the drawing of things. Now anyone knows Sarah's work, she knows that she, we, she is very big on the done part of life. Done parts of life is that picture we draw in our brains of what life looks like when things are done. And I don't do that real well, if at all. So I'm kind of a mess because I don't know where I'm going and I don't, so therefore it's hard for me to know how to get there. Oh yeah, you're jumping right there. All right, this is awesome. Oh wow, you're, you're gonna be my, my Vanna White. I don't know. In the classroom, I just outdated myself, but in this audience, I didn't. This is good. Okay. <laughs> Havana, who? The head goes sideways. And I want you to use the questions that I have written down there to guide you in thinking about your child at 25. What do you see? Yeah, this is, this is, this is a vision statement for you. What do you want to see next? Ideally, you want, you want to picture it as, as ideal as possible. Okay. Realizing that you know your child now, they, you know, you know who they are. <clears throat> okay, as you're thinking, I, I, I told myself I'd have to do it this way or we'd spend way too much time on this exercises, but pause there. You're gonna do a lot of pausing. What you're learning right now is, is one of the most important things to teach children is how to start a task. Because one of the most difficult things for most children to do, most adults as well, uh, um, this, this, there's this notion that starting the task is the hardest hurdle. That's the brick wall, right? But as soon as I start a task, I'm, I'm, there's, I will finish it with a higher degree of success than if I didn't start it at all. Think about the dishwasher. As soon as you start to empty the dishwasher, what typically happens? Typically. <laughs> Typically, you finish it. It doesn't matter if you bounce around with a couple other things. You typically finish emptying the dishwasher. It's a, it's a, it's a construct called the Zagarnik effect. And with that, it's a kind of, your brain goes through cognitive dissonance, this discomfort when a task is incomplete. So I'm having, you gonna, I'm having you start a series of tasks through this lecture. And you may, it's, what it will do though, is it'll initiate the likelihood that you'll finish it so I can get through everything, okay? Uh, even though you're going to feel really uncomfortable and you may dislike me for stopping you. <laughs> now we're going to go back to the present moment. I've had you jump into the future to your child's 25, come back to the present moment, and now I want you to write down 10 of, 10 of your child's strengths. Okay, so again, I'm going to cut you off on purpose. Second question, back to now. Again, what are, you, what are the top five things that you nag about the most? Nag is a term that your kids use. That's the only reason I use it. <clears throat> By the way, if you want to know if you're right, go home and ask your child. 
they probably will agree with you, and then they're going to say there's some other things you missed. I'm going to address nagging when I get into problem solving. It's one of the first major parts of this presentation is building problem solving skills. And um, that has, you will never see that phrase in any description of executive functioning. But it's the biggest symptom. It's where we see most problems persist is this struggle to problem solve. So we'll get into that. Uh, and then the last question is, what do you fear as it relates to your child? What's, what's those nagging kind of thoughts in the front or back of your mind that maybe bring you here, keep you up at night? OK. Again, you may have to pause. <clears throat> if you are, uh, you know, if you are following along on your, on your phone because you, you grabbed my slides, great. Uh, again, I'm going to go through a lot of content. It's not to overwhelm you. It's just to cover a lot of information that I hope people go back to as they want to revisit certain topics. Okay, so <clears throat> this is one of the most powerful sentences around what executive function is. Okay, it is, I love this, but this is not it doesn't take into account the relationship between executive function skills, self-regulation skills, and future intentions, future goals, future picture, future identity, the episodic memory of who I am trying to be. There, let's, for, for the sake of our talk conversation, there are three categories of executive functions that I want us to keep in mind. And this comes, out of, uh, this comes out of the Center on the Developing Child, Harvard University 2016 research, or uh, a paper that was written after collaboration and dissemination or gathering of information. And, and there are three categories, cognitive categories, that we want to be aware of. And I love that working memory is the first one. Working memory is significant. And we all should know at this point what working memory is and what it isn't, just because the research, it comes up. You, if you get a neuropsych, it shows up in there. If you're at an IEP meeting, it probably comes up in the conversation, or at least it should. Working memory is significant. If your child melts down at the end of the day, nine out of 10 days, it has nothing to do with a mood disorder as much as it might have to do with their working memory tank being at zero, and they can't filter emotions emotion, or thoughts at all. They are done. They're tapped out. Don't give them another demand or her another demand. Right? It's seen in classes as I go from math class to English. So let's imagine I walk into school 8 AM, math class, English class, science class, history class, gym, recess. All day long, my fuel tank is being emptied. But I'm supposed to manage the content from the first period. And then I get home at 4 o'clock, and I'm supposed to remember the content from the first period? That's insane. Every one of our children come at life from a weak working memory or lagging working memory skills, developmentally delayed working memory skills. We have to recognize that, and I'll talk about what we can do to support it. Inhibitory control, basically, it's the impulsivity of thinking, decisions. Looks like hyperactivity as a young kid, but it's, distract it's distraction in thoughts as well. It's the sitting there in class and the squirrel effect where I'm staring out the window lost for a half hour. It's the inability to control my thoughts and behaviors with purpose and direction. Again, we'll talk about how to help in that category as well. And the third one, cognitive flexibility. It's the ability to just go with the flow when need be. The opposite of that would be rigidity, stubbornness. It's my way and I dig in my heels. <clears throat> it's, so these three constructs are what are used at the same time to drive, to drive one's ability 
to think, to move with purpose, to self-regulate my body, my mind, my emotions with purpose towards a future goal. Raise your hand if your child is pretty self-driven, has goals already, and they just know what they're trying to do in life. Cool. Not, not really common, but there are kids that come into life and all you have to do is get out of their way. Feed them, clothe them, give them a roof over their heads. And they just have an innate drive to see a path through life that matches their, your expectations and everybody's around them. The rest of us see a child that might struggle to do that, to see where they're going. And therefore, they need something like this. How do you build these skills? How do you build these skills? How do you build these skills? Well, one way you can just, you can just back off and just realize with the grace of God, our kids will actually be okay. They'll be okay. Most of them figure it out. Okay, I'm saying that as a parent, I, I, I hope to God that's true. Because, you know, after I screw them up, I'm hoping they do okay. So, but as we look at our children with a greater intention and a greater, unfortunately, we take off the parent hat and we put on the coaching hat or the teaching hat or the executive function hat, we have to say to ourselves, where, how do I start to help my child see the future say the future, feel the future, play with the future, and be interactive with their future as much as possible. Okay? To do that, oh, forgot about my Samantha. So Samantha is a great, 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 great kid. Ball, uh, just a, she, I met her when she was nine. She's now 11. And this is one of the things uh, we put together for Samantha, and you can see the pictures in the side there, she was significantly dysregulated. And every moment was an inability to, to move with purpose through space and time. So the spatial and temporal awareness was non-existent. So we had to really task analyze her life starting in the morning. And I'll tell you, you've never seen a happier girl than to be able to take control of her life at the age of nine, to walk through her morning with a far de greater degree of purpose and intention and efficacy, self-efficacy that you, you thought you were dealing with a different girl. She was still the same Samantha, but what she was learning was that, there, that tasks put in the right order and sequenced in the right space and time can promote a really great feeling. So she was learning how to not only see what her day looked like right here. What do I look like when I'm ready to go? We were able to work backwards with her to say, well, what are the steps to get there? She came up with this. She walked around with a camera. We took pictures of her doing those things. Now that took a tremendous amount of work. But the result was, is that now this girl is seeing her future, playing with the future, and interacting with her future, and the emotions of her future with a stronger connection. And that becomes the story throughout all tasks, and all intentions, and all goals. So Matt was a similar story, but Matt's in college. Matt's my, one of my college kids, and Matt failed out twice. Graduated BC High with a full scholarship for golf to a D1 school. Failed out. He got into all sorts of stuff and uh, has severe ADHD, anxiety, OCD, the, uh, which is a symptom of the anxiety. And he came to me after failing twice with a, with really despair. He's like, I, I can't go back. Extremely bright kid. And he had to kind of retrain himself of what does it look like to be a college student? What does it feel like to be a successful college student? 
We took a series of videos. You should hear what he says. It's, it, you get goosebumps when he talks about the behaviors of a student that he'd never actually felt before. To raise your hand in class. To do the readings before class begins. And it was so affirming to him to have someone teach him these things. He wouldn't have listened in his high school year, senior in high school. He would have been like, I don't want the help. He had to fail twice before he listened. Uh, and again, that's my point. Our kids will be okay. He now graduated college and he graduated with a dual degree. And he's doing great. He has to own his disability deficits. He has to own who he is. So he has to treat his life with a high level of consistency and purpose to manage who he is. But as long as he does that, he, uh, he sees, he sees uh, his future. So what we have to do is we have to be able to kind of own what the problem is. And I had you write down about the nagging. The nagging is really just a symptom of the problem, right? We're getting into the weeds to solve the problems. And what I want us to do is I'm going to try to give us permission to let go of those problems. That's okay. Uh, it, to, to pull back on, those, on owning those problems. What we have to do in that, in that kind of list of nagging is we have to say, how do I stop nagging? And how do I empower my child to own the problem? And in doing that, what do I start to engage? Because if I'm going to do all the solving, then, then their child has no problems. Right? So I have to be, if I can do this, if I can pick five of the, of the 15 things that I like to, that I want to, that I, that I know are problems, and I want to start to shift how I start to address my child, how do I start to engage them in the executive function problem solving process? How do I start doing that? Well, first thing I have to do is I have to start <laughs> kind of therapizing myself, right? I have to, I have to look at problems as not mine anymore. Uh, raise your hand if you have a middle schooler. It's almost everybody. Raise your hand if you have a high schooler. Okay. All right, raise your hand if you have both. Okay. All right, so uh, middle school is, is significantly different than high school. Significantly. It's a time to make a lot of mistakes uh, without, typically, without um, long-term consequences. High school, if I make a mistake, there's typically evidence of that for the next four years. So I want to let my kid fall in their face as much as I, they can during middle school so that they can learn and grow and develop. And I'll be there to help them out, give them a tissue so they can blow their nose and deal with the emotions of that, of that process. But if I take the reins too much, because there may be things I do, if I take the reins too much, I may find myself holding that rein all through high school because now I'm really afraid that if I let go, the consequence might be too, too extreme. So as I've, as I've let go of the responsibility of the problem, I can't just let that be because I'm a conscientious parent. I kind of give a shit about my kid. I don't want to let go and not have a safety plan in place. Yeah. So I start thinking about how do I engage my child? How do I start probing them to think about the problem? And one, the best, uh, anyone Ross Green fans in the room? He's, he goes back a few years. Ross Green, lives in the balance. He started that. Uh, recently, but he's the uh, guru that uh, wrote The Explosive Child, uh, now t over 20 years ago, but uh, out of MGH. But his website is ridiculous. It's hours and hours and hours of free content. If you have an explosive chi like child that really struggles with the emotion of life, you have to spend time on his website. I can't, I can't take enough time here to work that with you, but it is really can be transformative. The second resource would be the whole brain child. Both resources will teach you the same first step, and that is to connect with your kid. 
What we do first is we throw the chair, right, across the room. And then we wonder why our kid isn't listening to us. What we want to do first is just connect. Ross Green will say, the best question you can ask is what's up, right? I mean, it's, as, it's super simple. What's up? Notice you're struggling. Yep. Well, you know, you're not going to get much at first, right? You're going to get you're going to get a very passive response. And if you're a parent that's been the frontal lobe for a long time, you're going to get a child that is still going to expect you to figure it out for them. So you may have to do it a hundred times, but that's okay. We we, we have a long way to go. But I have to start training myself. And if you have a, a if you have a spouse that is helpful, then you can call each other out on, on leaving this place, right? And you can call each other out on being the frontal lobe. And if I can back off and, and approach with a little bit with with unemotional, just connect. What's up? I know you're struggling. Now I can say that for anything and be okay. I might want to be more direct. I see you're struggling getting yourself ready this morning. What's up? Now you know what's up. <laughs> there is, you absolutely know what's up. That's not the point. The point is that you don't know the answer. You're, you know, every parent I deal with is an extremely conscientious parent. Okay? And that could be part of the problem. I want you all to, stop, to start sucking as parents. <laughs> right? I just, just ha be okay with that. Right? Get a glass of wine and say, I'm going to suck as a parent tonight. And just let it go. And then watch your child and then approach them. What's up? I notice you're, you, you, know, you're, you look like you're not sure what to do right now. You know what's up. You see the phone in their hand and they haven't put it down like, you at, like they were supposed to in your agreement of their evening schedule. Yes? Oh, there's so many layers there. <laughs> but all of those are just excuses. Okay? And I'm a huge fan of ignoring them all. But I'm a big fan of catching them as well. That takes time. You have to talk about excuses before they are in a, a self-deprecating state. You can't just start talking about excuses when they're in a place where they just need a hug. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry life sucks right now for you. But you know what I know about you? You always figure it out. I'm going to go make dinner. <laughs> like, you give it the attention that it needs because I heard you. I heard you, kid. I heard you. But I'm not going to pacify that moment but with anything else but letting you know that in this family, we typically work, you know, we work through those problems. And if you need help, you know where to find me. But, that's, but that happens a hundred times in a day. Uh, yes? Yeah, so we'll get to that. We have to frame them saying, that we have, so I'm going to get to that part in the next piece because they don't have any goals. They don't know where they're going, so therefore they don't know how to get there, which is what you just said, right? So we have to start talking about expectations with them. We have to become their goal setters, which is fine because our goals are their goals. They just don't know that yet. Or if they do, Good. It, they're, just, they're just ambiguous around how to achieve them. So the third step is to then start talking about your plan. Because maybe it has to do something that's about an assignment that wasn't passed in because he was out sick on Friday or she was out sick on Friday. So what's your plan? You sit down and you just talk about it. You listen to their plan. That sounds like a good option, option A. Let's talk about option B in case that one doesn't work out. It takes longer. I get it. Sometimes you just got to throw the solution at them and move on because your other kids got to get out the door. But if I can steal 100 times in a year to engage in this process, I'm, putting, I'm leaving them in the driver's seat. And I'm starting to power them to look at problems as their own. Okay. I want them to see, oh yeah, sorry, you're doing it again. 
Yep, I know, sorry. I, was, I, I cover the screen for you, and that's not helpful, Van. Uh, so you start seeing problems as their own. Uh, yeah, you can go to this one. <clears throat> so as you start to recognize problems, you start to empower them to meet your expectations, but own the problem. But I first have to conscientiously become a really bad parent and realize that I don't have to give the answers anymore. If I do, I'm really just perpetuating a cycle of codependency and maybe learned helplessness, which, by the way, that's what you should have on your fear list. That should be the two things, learned helplessness, okay, and codependency. Okay, quick exercise. Are we doing okay? Quick exercise before I jump into the next phase of this. <clears throat> we talked about what you nag about. Is this problem something that my child can be more accountable to own and manage? If the answer is yes, then write yes next to it. Now this is the, the really the, the only homework you're going to have here related to your child about these exercises. I want you to ask your child the same question around your nagging. What that does is it holds you accountable to recognize there's some things you might say that your child frames as nagging, but you never really saw it that way. But that's okay. It's their perspective that matters more than yours at this point. Okay? And that will also start a conversation on other topics that, we'll, that we're going to get into. Okay. We talked about goals. We talked about that some of our children struggle to regulate their behaviors and use executive function skills with deliberate, consistent purpose. And because of that, we have to step in and we have to create the road. And we have to give them the road map. And maybe we get out of the driver's seat, we sit in the passenger seat, we give them the keys, we give them the map, and we, and we create the bumpers. But we want them driving, because it's your life. I just know you, and I know I gotta create some boundaries here for you, kiddo, because if I don't, you might be off that road too quickly and in a ditch. In doing that, I have to start talking about expectations, family expectations. If your child's in middle school, you still have a chance to connect them with family values. Your family values are the goals and roadblocks and benchmarks that, sh that should help them regulate their decisions against maybe the biggest, the, 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 the risk factors around, uh, around dopamine-like behaviors, right? And that gets into kind of the, the, the tendency for kids that do struggle with regulation to get into recreational activities that may not be appropriate and good for them. So, um, you know, it's, it's too easy these days to walk into a bathroom and grab a e-cig e from one of your buddies. And next thing you know, you're wearing a patch because you started smoking, you know, three, car three cartridges a day. I'm, so many of my kids, you know, they, the clients, they, they've gone through that roller coaster. So um, our bumpers, our family values, the structure we build from the family out has to be louder than the chaos that's in their head and in, and in social media. If they spend more time on social media than they do with you, then you have to be realizing that they are building values that might be louder than yours. So we have to really bring that back to basics. Uh, I do not believe children should have cell phones uh, until they are very old. And for some children, that might be 26 years of age. Because the research will say that's when their brains are fully developed, for boys anyways. But I get, I, I, I get on a soapbox about that uh, because I think it creates noise that's unnecessary. And it bogs down their, their ability to regulate their, those areas that, you've, that we just highlighted with greater purpose and consistency. 
because now their, pri their list of priorities changes, where you had this simple health, family, school activities. Now I have this social aspect of things jamming up into that list and creating a lot of havoc. And we see that play out uh, all the time, all the time. So your expectations become the road roadmap, become, and this is kind of a parent goal that I, that I just put out there because it just makes sense to me and no one's told me that it doesn't make sense to them. Uh, but even our kids would agree to this. That's why when you sit down and you start talking about expectations and goals with your child, they're not going to disagree with most everything you say. They're actually going to agree because they want what you want. They want to do well in school. They want to get along with their siblings. <clears throat> they want to make good decisions when they're out with their friends. Uh, this is a family mission statement uh, that my own children haven't seen yet. <laughs> Um, but um, actually, my 10-year-old has, so uh, my 4-year-old has not. But this is just a very generic mission statement that captures what we typically want for our children. But what's in there also is, uh, is, is specifics around chores, supporting the family. I write in this family about 10 times in this statement. Again, I, if there's one thing to take away from here is your values need to be louder and more pronounced and more visceral than anything else in their world or else they're not going to follow your lead or if they, they will, but there's going to be a lot of struggles in between. You know, you, at the age of four, your child can handle more than we ever we can imagine. It's just the, you know, they, they, you have till from birth to seven, this is crazy statistics. It kind of scares me uh, to say, but you have till age seven to instill lifelong values. After that, the the efforts to change the, those those values is is astronomically different than the first seven years. So I have a four year old. I'm still in it. My ten year old. Uh, I, I, I'm. I, I, it is what it is. But I'm not. We're not going to give up. It's just I have this small window where my child looks at me like, like you know, that, that, that look in their face, like I'm the only thing that exists. And in that time period, I can teach them all about grit, perseverance, never giving up, family values around hard work, around chores, around discipline, all these aspects of being, you know, my little guy, being a man, I say, is, and, and I, I, can, I can do that. As they get older, it's a softer pitch. But we can lead by examples. Parents, we can't forget this. What we do, as they get older, what we do means more than what we say. Just cannot forget that. What we do means more than what we say. Okay? So you may say all the things to your child and they do the opposite. But as long as they watch you lead by example, most children will eventually shift in that direction. Again, if you, um, I'm not going to play that now, but these are just clips that you can get that talk about this in more detail. Quick exercise. Again, I'm going to have you start the writing and you have to finish later. Consider the priorities and expectations that frame your family values. I have a, I have a child that, a high schooler, and uh, He's really struggling academically, really struggling. And he'll go away to Florida for these weekend long lacrosse tournaments. He will skip school on Monday to make up the work and show up to school on Tuesday with very little done. When you ask him about priorities and you ask the family about priorities, now the parents, of course, are very upset about his academics. There's a part of me that says, why? As a family, you've, already, you, you, you've, you've set up in motion what the state expectation or what the priorities are. That sports sit kind of like right aligned with being a student. If not like sports even a little higher. So what's the confusion? 
I'm not confused. I know exactly why he's, because he can. Now, that's a very confusing place to put a, little, put, a, put a high schooler that does have dysregulation challenges. It's a hard place to put them, to be able to make that decision on his own. But this is the society we live in, right? We're parents, we can't give up the athletics because, boy, there's a potential that my kid could excel at, so I don't want to give that up. I get it. But it just muddies the water, clouds decisions, clouds your child's ability to see the simple decisions around regulating habits and emotions and behaviors. <clears throat> okay, good, good. Working memory. Working memory, okay. It, does your child love the excuse, I forgot? It's by the way not an excuse, it's probably legitimate. But it becomes an excuse because what it allows me to do as a child is it allows me to move on. I don't have to own the problem. I can just say I forgot. And then I can move on with the next interesting thing on my list of to-do list, right? But with a, from a working memory, I'm on a tangent, but working memory, it, uh, yeah, i get to the slide later on, but I don't know if I'll get there. So working memory is a is a powerful construct that we see a lot of symptoms uh, if there's a problem. And as a young child, so for example, you tell your kid to go upstairs and you give them three things to do, they come back with one of those things done. Okay, working memory, right? Um, the, the I forgot excuse may be legitimate. You can't ignore that they're not just, they're not just lazy and dumb, they're not lazy, right? They're not unmotivated. They may be legitimately forgot, but I forgot isn't, can't be an excuse to live by. So I have to help them figure out that that's not an excuse, kiddo. Let's see if we can figure out a strategy to not forget next time. But these are games, these are activities, these are real awesome things to do with your children at a young age or throughout life to continue to build these executive function skills. <laughs> And I like talking working memory about this one because, uh, because it has fun games like Sudoku or this game, which I've yet to find a kid that doesn't like this game. It's Canoodle. Uh, I have it in my office. I have like, my son who's four, he, he walks around with it. He's four. It's just fun. It's, it has level, you can do all sorts of levels. And, uh, and it works all, it helps with all levels of, of executive function skills. And, it's a great downtime exercise uh, activity as well. So these are just some things to kind of keep in mind. If you're doing some of them, great. You check them off. You're like, oh, right, I'm getting that done, doing that. If you're not, create time for board game night. Create time for just, I call it game night, uh, not video game night. <laughs> uh, but there are video games that uh, Tetris uh, is a uh, old school one that, uh, what other one, Tetris? Uh, um, uh, land, um, Minecraft, thank you. Uh, Minecraft has been shown to, to be s helpful, but I like to stay away from the games because once you go down that rabbit hole, it's like, where do I stop? And so I like to stay off of it. Uh, <clears throat> so strategies to work on the emotionality of things, to work on the rigidity of things. The, these are cognitive-based strategies here that if CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, not something I think you all should go get training on, but it's where a therapist can be super powerful. If you're on that fence as to should I, my child see a therapist, then I would say get off the fence and say yes. Because you get nothing to lose by my kid developing some core uh, cognitive-based strategies to manage and regulate and think and process and evaluate all of those core executive, uh, those cognitive-based skills that they're going to need through life. Self-talk, self-talk, uh, I can't say something and have a competing thought. So self-talk is a really awesome strategy that you can role play with your kids all the time. If my child is battling uh, self-deprecating thoughts and, and moments, I don't wanna teach self-talk in those moments because they're kind of, they're, they're, they're too deep. I just wanna empathize with them, give them a hug, Tell them they're gonna get, they'll figure it out, and 
But however, when on, you know, man, we should work on some self-talk stress, self-talk stuff. You remember, you know, you hear mom and dad use phrases like, because if you role model it, then they can start to practice themselves. Like, I got this. Right, I'm better than this. Oh, I can do one more hour of homework. Like, th just saying things out loud and you practicing it can affirm in them some, uh, th that th the cognitive shift that they need to finish a task. It's funny, I did my doctorate dissertation on self-efficacy of special education teachers. And then I find myself back in the world of self-efficacy as it relates to child development. And um, this is, you know, when we talk about fear, the fear is that I hold on too tight and I never actually let go. And then when I do let go, my child's drowning because I never gave him a chance to swim or to learn how to swim. So that's why I start with the problem solving section because I have to let go so I can teach my child to swim. In doing that, they're gonna fall a thousand times. And every time they fall, I'm gonna tell them, you know what? Every time you fall, you get back up. And that's what I love about you. You're a fighter. But I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I evil Amy. You know what? That's sometimes, I hate that, it sucks, man. You know, things are really hard for you right now, right? Why don't you go take a 30 minute, you know, just go chill. I'll tell you when 30 minutes are up and we'll pick, the, we'll pick, we'll pick up where we left off. How's that sound? All right. Are uh, you hearing me talk about the grit mindset, the language of perseverance, the language of pushing through? <clears throat> we kind of get into this, pa uh, this pacification of emotions by saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. When they know it's not okay, right? They don't, what they need to hear from us is, yeah, man, you're, this, this sucks. Yeah, I know it's not okay. I know it sucks that you studied for that test and you still failed it. Whoa, man, I would never want to study ever again. That just happened yesterday. You know, how, you know how bummed you feel when you have low self-efficacy around being a student, when you actually do feel like you've studied and you bomb the test? Guess what you want to do again? Not study, right? But that's why our kids are more resilient than what they give themselves credit because typically they do pick themselves back up, they brush themselves off, and they go study again. You're like, are you crazy? You just failed the last one. Why are you studying again? Because they know what your expectations are. So we have to meet them where they are, affirm some truths about them, but also let them know that keep them in, the, keep them in that emotional state and let them know they'll be okay, they'll figure it out. Right? We, we do live in a society where kids are overcharged with emotions, right? Because they feel like that, that but as soon as they start to learn how to you know, the, the grit of life, they can start to realize, oh, these emotions are okay. I, I can let this go. It doesn't, it's not going to get in my way because I've practiced a thousand times in middle school. <laughs> Dr. Hallowell out of Sudbury. Anybody, anybody know, anybody read anything about Dr. Ned Hallowell? Uh, he's written like 30 books. You probably have all read one of his books, but he lives in Sudbury. Uh, he talks about cognitive strengths, which is really the innate instincts that our children have that aligns with their gifts. Has anyone heard of Spartan races? I just shared out this awesome, on Facebook, uh, I shared out to my followers uh, a recent article about him and how he, sell, he, how he talks about his ADHD and he talks about his hyper-focused personality and he talks about how he followed his passion to create one of the world's largest obstacle course competitive venues ever. And uh, you know, so with that, we, we, as, as they struggle, as we nag, as we complain, as we talk about what's wrong, if we can see our way into where their gifts are, where their strengths are, we can help them, we can help them learn how to regulate themselves with greater purpose because they start to see and develop 
a stronger emotional relationship with who they want to be. If life always sucks, well, I don't really want much to do with life then. So I have to, at some point, see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that light at the end of the tunnel may have to come. They may, they may need your help to see it. I had this kiddo, in Paris, like two years ago, mom was sitting with me and she was talking about her son getting his ass kicked almost every day in school, not by peers, but just by the content. He, he just didn't belong, did not belong. He was a gifted, gifted child, but had nothing school could offer him. And as I listened to the mom, she's telling me all these things that she's, he's really good at, really good at. I said, have you ever looked at one of the Aggie schools? for farming, animal farming, by the way. By the age of seven, this kid has birthed 13 cows, right? He, he, he is a, he's a, he, he was a little, he was a little veterinarian without the degree. All he had to do was be put in a place to excel in that one area and then everything else would take care of itself because he'd leave school so depressed that he didn't want anything to do with life. So we had to give him something after school or during school to affirm his existence, right? To give him an identity, give him a future picture that he could, he could fall in love with. And I checked in with the mom about a year ago and she was just, she, you know, her, her email was just one of those ones that like you, you want to share with the world because it's like, you know, he's just doing great. Yeah, still has struggles, but he's loving each day as opposed to the opposite. So I get, and I get it. It's extremely difficult to try to fit a square peg into a round hole, which is why we have to think outside the box in any way we can. If I get my butt kicked all day in school, I need something else to affirm my existence on this planet. What is it? Maybe it's sports. Great. Right? Maybe it's I'm a big buddy and I help this special needs kids around town because I love that stuff. Maybe I have a job. I mow lawns every day and I make a lot of money and I love that. Whatever it is, I just have to find something that's mine that I can start to, you know, put my attention behind, intention behind and build an identity around. Uh, it's not easy. But I think as we think about my child's strengths, maybe we can start to build on that. Um, but in high school, it's content, 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 standardized tests, SAT scores, college, unless you're at the Aggie school down the street, which, by the way, I loved driving by. I was like, this place is awesome. So let's keep in mind something else that, um, that we know is true. Um, success in life doesn't come to those that aren't hardwired to struggle. You, there's no success in life if I don't know how to struggle, ever. I can't even stay married if I don't know how to struggle. So recognizing that with our children, they are all masters of struggling, recovering, persevering. They have to know that because high school is not going to change for them. School is not going to change for them. What will change over time is they figure out what they're good at. What am I good at? I have this kid, really awful at almost everything except math. I said, kiddo, man, that is your strength. I don't care about anything else. You're just going to become really good with numbers. He's like, really? I said, yeah. I don't sweat anything else. You know what it takes to become an accountant? Numbers. You don't have to be a writer. So he, that, that kid's blessed. He's blessed with this area that he can focus on and develop. School's going to kick his butt in every other class until then. But that's okay. We live in a, Massachusetts. We live in a place where you can take eight years to graduate college and because you have all of these services around you to help you either way. I mean, community colleges are the best invention ever for those kids that want to, that want to write a new chapter and start over and make it because they've grown up. <laughs> They've caught up. Uh, the mirroring traits. So as you write down what you nag about, what are the behaviors? How do I flip it to see what their strengths are? A stubborn kid, love it. Once they figure out what they want to do in life, that stubbornness 
is going to keep them so focused and hyper focused on their goals. It's so true. <laughs> so see what their their weaknesses are, their strengths. If it doesn't, just because it doesn't match you, doesn't mean it's not something that's going to blaze a trail for them. Who wants to know how to put your expectations into action? Would that be helpful? You're going to talk about expectations. You're going to talk about the values of things. How do you put them into action? Well, as Sarah Ward will tell you, your expectations are the done. This is your goals, kiddo. This is your future. This is who you are striving to be. Now we have to create your do, we have to put this into actionable steps. Yes, homework is important, but the skills to do homework are the same skills that I use to get up in the morning and out the door, by the way. I follow a series of tasks to complete a morning routine. I, com I complete a series of tasks to complete my math, my science, my English, my social studies, and my spelling. It's the same cognitive constructs. I'm just asking, don't start with what they suck at the most. Work on other areas and build them up so that when it is time to do homework, they have some prerequisite, foundational, cognitive-based strengths to build on. Which is why you saw Samantha working on the morning routine. There's nothing more affirming than independently getting your ass out of bed and out the door. Every one of our children can make that happen. It might take mom or dad leaving the house for three weeks <laughs> to make that possible. Because our children just know that mom or dad will be in the room at some point to get me up. <laughs> but I can start helping to frame out their life. And do this with them. This isn't a directive that you will throw on your child. You sit down, you talk about, and you process, and you evaluate, and you problem solve their morning. I notice you're really struggling to really walk, get through your morning with, with, um, calmly. The expectation now is shifted. You need to be able to manage your mornings independently. What? They're going to say they agree with you. They're not going to challenge that. This is where you're building the episodic memory. What does my future look like? What does it feel like? How do I self-regulate myself with greater intention throughout my day? Not just homework, but it will take care of itself when you do it this way. I promise. No parent has called me after doing these and says, you absolutely lied to me. I want, you know, I want my time back. <laughs> you start with affirming their existence as independent young men and women. And you'll get to the homework piece of things. I would say if your child is old enough and if they're four or older, they are. Sit down with them and have them come up with a, their version. Maybe you come up with your version and you collaborate. Keep in mind, there's two things you want to focus on. Space and time. Where am I? What time is it? Who am I? What time is it? I am a toothbrusher at 635 in the bathroom. OK? In the <laughs> if I'm multitasking, maybe. Not jumping on the bunk bed. <laughs> I've had children change their whole morning around and have it be better than how their parents saw it. So I've been part of the process. Because honestly, you don't necessarily care all that much where certain things go if it all makes sense. But if your child's running up and down the stairs six times, well, that tell, that, that's your ob observation of their dysregulation of seeing the, con the flow of a day. It's okay. We're going to tra retrain them on that. Mm -hmm. but, you th but they can have a significant voice in how it looks. Okay? That's why there isn't a such thing as consistent after afternoons. If your kids have a busy after school life, Mondays are different than Tuesdays, different than Wednesdays, different than Thursdays. So even though Mondays different than Tuesdays, different than Wednesdays, where are the similarities? 
and where can I start to develop a picture of what Mondays typically look like, what Tuesdays typically look like, what do Thursdays and Fridays typically look like, okay? And you have to do that by playing it out on paper so that they're seeing it or even drawing pictures if they're that young. Chores. You can throw chores in here, obviously, as you think about family values, core values. Their ownership of family and their role in the family should have a significant weight to it. Give them a burden to bear. Because if they're bearing a family burden, then they are developing more identity of who they are as a person than anything else that they will do. No sports team, no A on a math quiz. The burden they bear to help the family matters. So start as young as possible. And hold them accountable because that is a valuable role they're playing that the family expects them to finish and manage and consistently do well. Just chores. But the list is endless when you think of chores. It can be take the dog out. It can be, um, you know, take care of the dog. The dog will die without you taking care of it. You are responsible for the dog. Get a guinea pig. <laughs> that might die too. <laughs> same, same, same outcome. Now you're at that part of time that we talk about one of the major priorities of being a student. I have to sit there. As a middle schooler, how many hours? About an hour of homework? As a high schooler, two to three. As a college kid, three hours a day. So I want to start helping them regulate their attention for an hour if they're in middle school. And you start just helping them. You talk about their routine. You talk about when's it start, when's it end. And building on that. If parents really uh, see their kids struggle with studying because they see them failing, when they look at the quiz test category, the assessment category. But there are massive uh, preliminary skills to, that I have to be able to walk through first before I can become a studier. So I try to recognize that in this order, and I don't know if I did a good job, but I see so many kids nowadays that are so overscheduled at a young age that they never actually learned how to sit and read. They can read. But they never learned how to sit and read for extended periods of time. And if I were to say what one of the most major prerequisites of studying is, is to sit and read. So what many children do is they try to cut that corner, I mean, severely cut that corner by not reading throughout the course of being a student. And therefore, and then they wonder why I don't, I don't know how to, I don't, my grades are low. So there's some prerequisites there. And as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a group of kids that may already struggle with self-regulation skills and attentional skills and, and uh, working memory skills, I'm, I've missed out on years of practice. And now they're in high school. Crap. Where studying actually really matters now is this generation is confu is, has lost a balance. And then when I get to high school, it's so late, it's too late. Like, to, to reteach myself to do that, and now my hand penmanship sucks, I can't even take notes. Crap, that's like two strikes against me. And now I'm supposed to learn how to study. It can be done, of course, but the hurdles are bigger, and it takes more time, and boy, does it take some persistence and some real motivation. But we can't sit back, we can't point fingers at them. Uh, but we, should, we just have to acknowledge that and be aware of it and see what help we can provide. Um, okay, we can switch. Uh, what do you guys want to know about cell phones? So, they're, they're, so yeah, so my, my opinion on the phones or, or my professional uh, perspective on it is there's only really one valuable tool the phone provides, and that's speech to text. Speech to text. I can write a five paragraph essay on my phone. Better than I can on my computer, by the way, because of the, feet, the functionality of, of, of that device. That's an amazing resource for students that no one uses. Okay? Training my kids how to do that is extremely important to them because most of them have pretty you know, gross motor, uh, fine motor issues to begin with. 
Uh, <clears throat> secondly, the phones now are better. You can lock them down pretty tightly now. So uh, there's far less problems when you think about what I can control on a phone now versus just three or four or five years ago. So um, that's really, really important to be able to continue to create s tight boundaries around its use or access. Um, um, the other fear thing I have on my list is they can access every dark corner on the planet from their phones. And when you think dark corner, I want you to think of the darkest corner you can imagine. And they know how to get there because they're curious and they have self-regulation issues. So they, they're not going to be able to filter those thoughts quick enough before they're on the dark places because they're curious. And that's our fault. So in the old days, you went to your bedroom and there was just nothing to do but homework. That's why you hear me say, find a common area, create common spaces in the house, study areas in the common areas, and help promote a library-like atmosphere. And if you do that in a positive way, no one's going to fight it. Your children won't fight that. If it becomes punishment, yeah, then it's going to be more of a, more of a battle. If you can teach them the tool, the, how it is a tool, then um, that allows them to see a nice balance between its use as a social media outlet or a gaming outlet and how, how the, it can be used as a tool. All of us got our phones primarily as a tool. It wasn't given to us as a, as a, uh, as a social outlet. Uh, most of them see it as that. It's their access to their friends. So um, back in the day, you couldn't go to the mall on a Tuesday night. You couldn't go to the mall on a Wednesday night. You couldn't go to the mall on a Thursday night because it was a school night. The phone is the mall. So we just have to recognize that. You know, it, some kids can figure it out. But and just having open dialogue with it as well keeps the kids aware of the because they know it's a struggle. They know when they're not do using it right. And it's their journey. They're going to have to figure this out when we're long gone. Like, there's, there's, this is, a, this is a, tra a trajectory that we have no idea how it will all end. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, yeah, I've seen most of our kids have, have them too early. And then the social pressures create this kind of negative feedback loop for a lot of them, where now they're part of text messages that they should never have been a part of and things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I would say the tools that the phone can offer are not powerful enough to warrant the phone. Because every one of those tools I can show you on a laptop. But that being said, it doesn't mean you don't, they don't use one. I think it's, it's, a, it's a personal journey. Um, and this tool right here is still the most powerful tool for teaching and regulating and planning and prioritizing and organizing my thoughts. This is your school. You guys have Asp you guys have Aspen, right? And you guys have a Google Classroom, right? And so what a lot of students realize is I don't need this because everything is accessible on Google Classroom. And they might be right because every teacher might be using Google Classroom. Not too many districts, and you could tell me if this district is, is this way. It's hard to have a universal policy that every teacher, young and old, <laughs> is posting their content consistently on Google Classroom. They're, so that becomes the cracks in the foundation of that solution. Still, it's, it's not, it, it, it is a battle. But I think, the, and, and, and how you win it is, it depends on, on, I would say if you really want to win it, you put everything behind it and make it the most important tool on the planet. Where everything that they want access to is conditional on the successful and continuous use of a planning system. If you adhere to that expectation, the unlimited privileges that will be bestowed upon you as a child of this family will be endless. <laughs> Trips to Disney World, Friday nights out. 
If you don't, everything is off the table. Now, why would that, that, would that pitch matter? I just think it depends on the emphasis you put on it. And then you promote a positive feedback loop around checking in on it. Uh, so if I want to track how my kid's doing, I will never look here. You know why? It's a symptom of how they're doing well or how they're not doing well. Right? If I want to know how my child is doing and I want to be proactive <laughs> and I want to be present in time, right? Because that's a symptom of the past, right? This helps me manage the present. This helps me manage the present. This does help me double check. Right? To double check to make sure I have everything in case I forgot. But this becomes a powerful tool. Now, if I want to teach kids how to study, this becomes even more powerful because now I can future plan and I can start thinking about long term assignments in a thoughtful way. And I can start seeing what I look like on a Sunday with, two, with a paper due on Monday and a test on Tuesday. Now, that takes some practice. Most kids don't want to write anymore. It is an uphill battle. Uh, <clears throat> there are few alternatives that I, would buy, that I buy into, even though I've tried them all. My homework app I've tried, and other online platforms. But I will say, if a child is getting 80% of their homework done and missing a couple here and there, I, I just would not make a big deal of that when you think of the big picture and their ongoing efforts. The I forgot from time to time, and you pick your battles. I will say my expectation, as you read, is 100% homework completion. Why? I, I don't want any cracks. In college, I'll say you go to every one of your classes, no exceptions. You know why? You know what happens when you miss one class? What do you give yourself permission for if you miss one class? To miss two. If I miss one homework assignment, what do I give myself permission for? Two, so you, you help to create an unconditional relationship around behaviors and habits. And that helps also frame out consistency, because that's the opposite of dysregulation. It's consistent, positive habits. But no, there's no, I don't have, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, there is no pill you can take, right? There's, there, there's no, there's, there's no spe special formula. I just say from a parent perspective and from a behavioral perspective, what, what do I put behind this? Uh, the alternative is, is you just you teach them, um, I have sticky notes in the back, but you just teach them to, to also be able to write things down. If you're tracking their progress using these tools, they're going to do better when they look at themselves in the grade book. And they're going to feel better. It'll eventually start to be a positive feedback loop without them even knowing it. And then eventually after th uh, you know, 45 days, you start to see a little shift, some longer. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, good, good, good. So uh, self-monitoring. So what we're talking about, so this becomes a tool for self-monitoring. If I want to help my child promote problem solving, promote self-monitoring, promote reflection, promote evaluation of self, I need physical reference points to do that. I just can't look in my own brain and say, how am I doing? I'm doing okay. Because that's what ends up being said. How are you doing? Good. Prove it. I, I, I don't want to show you how, how bad my good is. Right? So they have to develop concrete reference points. So when you talk about yourself, you can check in on a Friday night if you want to look at grades. Because grades might be conditional on certain activities for the weekend. Sure. I would say use this as conditional for activities on the weekend. Sunday night's an awesome time for a family meeting to talk about what my week looks like. And to have your child lead a conversation around what activities they have that week. Now that's pretty sick. Could you imagine that you're sitting at the, at the table and your child is telling you what their schedule looks like for the week? That's where they should be as you think about the evolution of this. Because if they're owning their soccer schedule and they miss three practices because they didn't tell you they needed a ride, is that your problem? Well, you might think it is because you're paying for it. You've got to ignore that. They don't want to miss practice 
as much as you don't want them to mispractice. But when they own the problem, guess what's going to happen the next week when they sit down and talk to you on Sunday night? Are they going to be better or worse? They're going to get better at that conversation. So you talk about the week and what it looks like. Really, really powerful. Okay. Uh, let's try. Can you go to the working memory one? Yes. And I talked about the symptoms of low working memory. Meltdowns, poor note taking, forgetfulness, poor problem solving skills, um, poor task planning. Okay, go to the next one, please. All right, supporting working memory. I, have, uh, I teach freshmen in high school. I love freshmen. They're, they're so innocent and clueless and naive and just awesome. Like, they don't have the high school chip on their shoulder that sophomores do. And I'll ask them, I said, so on Monday morning, I asked them, so what time did you guys go to bed last night? And I started, started having this, they were so honest. I heard 3 a.m., 1 a.m., 10 p.m. I heard 8.45 from two kids. Guess what sport the 8.45s play? Hockey. Oh, so you guys aren't, I don't even know if you have this sport in this town. You have to be, you have to be, yes. Do you have crew here? No. Okay, yeah. It's I went to a school that had yeah, okay. and they got up way too early. Crew. <laughs> it's either crew or swimming. Because mm -hmm. swim teams also have 6 a.m. practices in certain in areas. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. So those kids were in bed early. But why would I talk about working memory and sleep? Sleep is one of the most powerful um, refueling um, options you have. Power naps are awesome. I'll teach most high school and college kids how to use power naps to refuel. Can't go over 20 minutes. Yeah, can't go over 20 minutes. Uh, and so all of these are very helpful for working memory. We, we, we're done. I'm going to stop there. Like I said, I was not going to get to some of the cooler slides that had to do with risk factors and, um, and, and data around, boy, there's data around reading in here. There's data around screen use in here. That's from 2016, so pretty new when you think about 2016 versus like, 2020, but, um, but it is really cool to see how what teenager, middle schoolers are doing and high schools are doing when you think of social media access and you think about uh, how the decline in reading starts and drastically changed in middle school. And it went from like 30 minutes a day in middle school to like 10, minute, 10 minutes or less in high school. Uh, and um, and uh, I, you know, it's, it doesn't talk about the whys, but it is good to kind of see how certain trends in being a student shift in how inter interaction with technology um, may be a culprit or maybe something else like the overscheduledness of our generation as well. So 